When the New York Jets hired Joe Douglas and subsequently Robert Sala and drafted Zach Wilson, color me Homer, delusional, whatever you I mean, the videos are still on the infancy of my channel. You can watch them. But uh, I felt that the Jets had, you know, the, the pieces in place to be in the best position they've been in, in terms of sustained success in my life. I really did. Thought we had the, the GM with the vision. Thought we had the leader in Robert Sala. And contrary to me maybe being a hater because I don't think Zach Wilson is quite MVP material, uh, I thought we had our quarterback at the time when we drafted him out of BYU. So I don't make this video lightly, And but I should the Jets clean house, right? And on its face, it can't be a hot take to even ask. Wherever you stand, wherever you think of the solutions or Aaron Rodgers, we're going to get into all that in this video. It's probably going to be way longer than it needs to be just because I want to address everything instead of kind of having to go back in the comments. Like, I just want to stamp it all out. Um, but your JD and Robert Sala, their combined winning percentage is ahead of only the co-tight era in Jets history. In Jets history. Joe Douglas, 25 and 56. He... If the Jets win the last three, if Jets lose the last three games, he will be the most losing GM to get a sixth year in the modern era of football. There's one stat for coaches and GMs, and these two men have been awful at it. So on its face, you have to ask the question. You have to ask the question. So we're going to go through it with Salah and with Douglas. Now, with Douglas, we talked about the win-loss record, and I will say this to Joe Douglas's, Joe Douglas's credit. I do think the the talent improvements on the roster from when he was hired to now, it the roster talent is improved in a way that is not fully reflected by the win loss record, right? You know, guys like Sauce Gardner, um, Garrett Wilson, you know, Bryce Huff, Jermaine Johnson, Brees Hall, uh, DJ Reed, like were really good and at a lot of positions we hadn't been for a lot of time. Garrett Wilson might be the best receiver we've drafted since I've been born. Seriously. Even Tyler Conklin is like the best tight end we've had since Dustin Keller. Okay, so, so I'm not completely oblivious to that, right? I, I do think Joe Douglas is better than Mike McCagden and John Idzik, for whatever that is worth to you. But in terms of predicting future success, I hate to be a hater, but it's kind of most of this is collected between two moves that are, or two, the Jamal Adams trade and the 2022 draft class. Like it's it's the bulk of it, man. Because you got Garrett, Sauce, ABT, Breach, Jermaine, Quinn Williams, and CJ Mosley. Arguably eight of the Jets' 10 best players have resulted from one trade, one draft, and then two of those guys in Quinn and CJ, two all pros who are holdovers from the previous GM. And, and other than that, it's been a lot of bad signings and a lot of a lot of lackluster drafting. Now, I will say also to Joe Douglas's credit, he does have a knack for getting some diamonds in the rough. Quincy Williams, right? Off the scrap heap, JFM off waivers. Uh, Bryce Huff, Tony Adams, UDFA. You know, even guys like Braxton Berrios who can come in and, and be serviceable, guys who are doing nothing on other teams. But man, if you look at the big investments, this is probably the biggest indictment of Joe Douglas as a GM. These are the, the contracts that Joe Douglas has given out that are of um, $7 million in annual value or higher. Okay, Carl Lawson, $15 million a year. Okay, like the player, but you you signed a guy who had three season-ending injuries at the time of the signing, and he's hurt. You signed a hurt guy, he stayed hurt. Lakin Tomlinson, fourteen million a year. Okay, did I think Lakin Tomlinson was going to be that bad? No, but that's why I'm not a GM, and and Joe, and Joe Douglas should be fourteen million. And he's given up the most pressures in of any guard in the league this year. He's been a bottom ten guard in the NFL, uh, getting paid all pro money. Awful. Corey Davis, like the player, but inconsistent, not durable, 11 million. Just that wasn't a good contract either. Alan Lazard, 11 million a year. He's even worse than Corey Davis. Dwayne Brown, 11 million. Okay, one decent season and one season unplayable. Not a successful signing. DJ Reed, boom, 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 home run. DJ Reed, honestly, might be the, he's one of the best Jets free agent signings in a, in a long time. In a long time. Um, Fant, one good year. You know, Uzama, 8 million. Awful. Cook, 8 million. Awful. Gerard Davis, 7 million. 
Brashad Perriman, seven million. Ryan Khalil, seven million. Waste, waste, waste. Tyler Conklin, seven million. Solid contract. So of all those, the only ones that you can say were a certified success, in my opinion, are DJ Reed and um, um, Tyler Conklin. Out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen contracts of seven million dollars or more, and only two of them are certified hits. That's not a high enough batting average, especially when it's not the draft. It's not a complete crapshoot. These are pro players that you have. You you see who they are. And some of these you got bit by some injury luck or whatever. But some of these like Uzama, Lazard, Cook, like these were obvious, egregious overpays. Draw Davis. Who else was given Draw Davis seven million? Man. And he's had some steals, some some smaller, cheaper deals that have been steals. Um, so maybe his spot in a front office is like some sort of smaller scale scale personnel scouting. But these big investments, he can't be trusted with the checkbook. He just can't. You can't you can't light money on fire that way. Now, okay, what else? Quarterback Joe Douglas was gifted the highest draft pick this franchise has had in the 21st century, second overall pick. And yeah, he did what a lot of te- he did what a lot of other teams would have done in taking Zach Wilson. I'm not going to pretend like Zach Wilson wasn't a good prospect. I'm not going to pretend like it was just because of the one thrower in the pro- during the pro day or anything else ridiculous. Okay, but we're not man. It's like we're judging results here. Okay, so Zach Wilson was either a just a bad pick, b a good pick who was poorly developed, or c most likely in my opinion a little a mixture of both. But here's the thing. Joe Douglas picked the player and Joe Douglas hired everyone who was in charge of his development. Heavyweight is the crown. You're the GM, dude. And then, and typically when, when a team does a Zach Wilson, when a quarterback bottoms out that badly, like Jimmy Clausen, Josh Rosen level badly, um, you, you don't get another shot at quarterback usually, but Aaron or Joe Douglas did with Aaron Rodgers and he brings him in. But that comes with its own set of problems because now it's a plan B and plan B's have warts. And Aaron Rodgers comes in and okay, but and now everybody that's been attached to Rodgers has been awful. And Joe Douglas can't get a complete pass on that. I'm sorry. Because if those signings worked out, JD would get credit. If Cook was lighting it up, JD would get credit. If Lazard was good, JD would get credit. But he's not. And he could have avoided that whole situation by either by Zach Wilson being either good or properly developed, right? Could have avoided that. It's your second, it's your second shot at quarterback and, and not a lot of GMs get a second shot, man. And then people will, and then people will tell me all, oh, well, it's, um, it's right. It's, it's not JD. It's Salah. There's good players, but the coaches suck. Okay. We're going to get to that. Who hired the coaches? Again, if if Robert Sala is a bad coach, that is not an excuse for Joe Douglas. It is a further indictment. So you want him to hire another coach and pick another quarterback after he's already botched it, that, both of those things? And, and here's the, the question of who are you going to replace him with, right? Will you fire him or who are you going to bring in? Okay. When the Jets went to the podium, got to the podium last year and said, we're bringing in a new quarterback. Uh, we didn't know who it was going to be. We didn't know. Aaron Rodgers, he's not coming here. He you're not going to get Aaron Rodgers. Even Derek Carr, he's not going to sign here. You can't draft one. We didn't know. But we all knew that it had to be different because it was just too bad. We're getting to that point. We're getting to that point with the men in charge of this organization. And furthermore, let me ask you this. Do you want Joe Douglas... And Robert Sala, as a lame duck head coach and GM, heading into the last year of their contracts with no extension, you can't extend them, obviously. And now you're giving Joe Douglas another offseason, another draft class, another uh, a top eight pick, uh, an, uh, opening up, letting him open up the checkbook again to now not be forward thinking. It's now maybe even further mortgage the future to try and save his ass for one more season. That's part of the equation, too. So bottom line for me on JD is I think there's a good chance he is just one or two spots too high in the front office. Obviously, he had jobs uh, somewhere in the front office for two awesome organizations in Philly and Baltimore. So maybe it's a little bit of the Peter principle here. Maybe everyone's just doing a gig uh, one step above you know 
punching above their weight class a little bit. That might be the case. Yeah, I just think his body of work suggests you're going to get egregious free agent spending, substandard draft drafts, and um, some nice trades and some and some nice plucks off the waiver wire. And to me, the totality of that combined with a twenty five and fifty six record is just not indicative of a plus GM, in my opinion. If he leaves, he leaves. Uh, Robert Sala, let's get to him. Can somebody tell me? I asked my buddy Dom C this on the stream yesterday. Can somebody tell me one trait that Robert Sala has demonstrated in three years that differentiates him uh, in terms of being a head coach rather than a defensive coordinator? Because I agree, he's an awesome defensive coordinator. And people tell me he's a leader of men. Uh, okay, the men like him. I think he's a, a likable guy. I think he's a, a good dude. I think he's an honorable. I'm, I'm, tr- I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I, I think that matters. You don't want to. You don't want a scumbag. You don't want Adam Gase or Urban Meyer representing your team. Um, but I, I think the leader of men has kind of become a hollow phrase because no one can tell me what the men are being led to do. What are the men being led to do? They're being led to lose. We know that they're being led to get blown out. Robert Sala has more losses by double digits in his tenure than he has victories. More losses by double digits than he has victories. They're being led to tell the media they were out-schemed and out-efforted. They're being led to make Mike White t-shirts. They're being led to dress up as the Easter Bunny before getting blasted by three touchdowns. They're being led to roll into Miami with a Super Bowl hangover. After one win, they have a Super Bowl hangover. They can't even get off the plane in Miami. As they lose 30 to nothing, falling to 0 and 9 against Tua Tunga Vailoa and Mac Jones combined. That's what they're being led to do. They're being led to be uncompetitive in their division. They're being led to have three of the five single game lowest offensive outputs in Jets history. In an era where teams throw for 250 yards by accident, it's almost as if they're not being led at all. And you might say he fixed the defense. And again, I do think he's a good defensive coordinator. And the Jets defense has done a does one has done a 180 since he's been here. And he would have a job as a DC like that if you were fired tomorrow. And that's hardly slander. He could go make two million a year for the next 15 years being a defensive coordinator. And a damn good one. And I will say, just like I gave props for JD for some of the fish strengths, Robert Sala, I do think. Uh, there's been some very impressive player development on the defensive side of the football where you look at guys like Michael Carter, Bryce Huff, um, <clears throat> you know, Quincy Williams, who are afterthoughts, Tony Adams, who have uh, made themselves into anywhere from nice role players to core players of the defense, even guys like DJ Reed, Quentin Jefferson, who have had career years uh, since linking up with Salah in New York. Like, his defensive acumen is legit. Okay. I'm not denying that. Um, but. <sighs> Is that enough? Because in my opinion, the offensive side of the ball can be can leverage coaching more than the defensive side of the ball in the modern NFL. I like that's that's not anything about Salah specifically. I think that's just how that's how the game works right now. I think that offensive co- offensive gurus can stretch their talent further than good defensive coaches can the other side of the ball. Right, like Sean McVay having the the Rams with you know an older uh, Stafford and a bunch of rookie receivers, you know, at, at eighth in the NFL in scoring. I don't think if he gave Robert Sala mid talent, he could drag the Jets to a top three or top ten um, defense. I just don't think that's how the game is right now. Or Mike McDaniel. Right, accentuating elite talent all the way to first in scoring. Right, if you took away Mike McDaniel from the Miami Dolphins offense and Robert Sala from the Jets defense, which unit would take the most immediate drop off? The Dolphins offense, in my opinion, just the nature of offensive versus defensive coaching. And you might say, well, the offense isn't on him. That's on the offensive coordinators, guys. Head coach, head coach. If the offense wasn't on him, he would be the defensive coordinator. That's not how leadership works. You don't get to absolve yourself of half of your operation being historically inept because that wasn't your previous area of expertise. I've used the the analogy and I'll use it again. If you go into a grocery store and you go to the store manager and you complain and you say, hey man, I was in your 
your dairy aisle and there was cockroaches all over the floor. It was like birds flying around on the ceiling. All your, your yogurt and your cheese is moldy. And the store manager says, uh, hey, look, my background's in produce. That's not my problem. It's ridiculous. You're the manager. You're the head coach. It's your job. And if the guy running the dairy aisle ain't up to snuff, it is your job to figure that out. Straight up. And probably the most, the thing that is most within his control that it's the most infuriating to me is the inability to to put your best players on the field. The personal decisions have been objectively bad. And this year alone, playing the ghost of Dwayne Brown, injured, not even ready to be active, instead of putting ABT at tackle to start, putting McGovern and Schweitzer ahead of Tittman until injury forced it when Tittman was better than, he was the best out of the bunch from the jump. The ghost of Cobb over Gibson, Uzama over Ruckert, Dalvin Cook over anybody who isn't the worst running back in the NFL or who at least will try at least we'll feign the effort of, of a blitz pickup. Bryce Huff just two weeks ago played over 50% of the snaps in a game. I just, okay. he's not a good run defender. I get it. I get it. He's the most hellacious pass rusher in the freaking NFL. Play him, play him more. It's a passing league. I don't care. And the bottom line on Salah is that, in my opinion, his defensive acumen, although legitimate, does not compensate for what is either a laissez-faire approach or complete ineptitude on the offensive side of the ball, compounded by the team's undisciplined and unprepared nature, most dead ball and personal foul penalties of the last three years combined, and the worst first quarter uh, point differential combined. Undisciplined unprepared if he goes he goes nate hackett is absolutely terrible there's no sense in me making this video close to 20 minutes long talking about nate hackett for more than a minute his he's been a play caller for seven years his average scoring rank is 24th he's had one good year he's never done the job for more than two years without being canned and he would be nowhere near a headset if he wasn't friends with aaron Rodgers. So I don't have the perfect solution for you if these men lose their jobs, but I'm not going to be crying over spilled milk if they're gone. They've just been bad and we'll talk all soon.